you did end up getting drafted. I don't want to. I don't want to leave out the fact that you did make it to the NFL. You did get drafted by the San Francisco 49ers in the 2013 NFL draft. After everything you had been through at South Carolina, and I guess just starting from your childhood all the way up. What was that moment like for you? Even though your perspective was changing, the NFL, dude, like 99% of people, that never happens. Well, just because I I went through those injuries doesn't mean I lost the game, lost the love of the game of football. I will always and forever love the game of football. And any opportunity to play it where I felt like I could make a difference, I was going to take that opportunity. And I knew... After that last injury, my window was dwindling. My window was closing real quick. You know, nobody wants a running back with two knee injuries. So I had to get back. Uh, I had to rehab. I was able to put put together a performance on Pro Day uh, where I showed my footwork. I showed my, par- my progress. Uh, and that was about four and a half months uh, after the injury. I was able to do a little bit. And, and that and that was enough. Uh, and, you know, through the interviews of, you know, meeting with different teams and also meeting with Coach Harbaugh, I think he saw that, you know, I was serious and he saw my character and how hard that I'd been working. And they took a chance and they gave me an opportunity. And I'm, I'm again, another life changing experience going out to San Francisco, uh, learning from Frank Gore. Uh, my running back coach at the time was Tom Rathman, who played in two Super Bowls, gathering all this knowledge uh, and, and being in an NFL locker room. An absolute dream come true. Dream come true. Did it matter at that point, the round or anything? Because prior to the injury, I know you were being talked about as a first round pick. Did it even matter at that point anymore? Or was it just like, hey, I, I want to get a chance in the NFL? I didn't care. I didn't care where I went. It, I heard from fr- even after the injury, I heard from first round to undrafted. So my agent literally had no clue. He was talking with a bunch of teams that were very interested. He was talking with a few teams that wouldn't even sniff at the possibility of drafting me. The San Francisco 49ers took a, t- took a chance on me. And uh, I still have a relationship with that front office today. <laughs> they call on me whenever they're at South Carolina uh, and, and they're looking for guys, especially when I was working there. We talked about Debo Samuel a, a lot with their head scouts, you know, so that relationship still exists today. Although I didn't get an opportunity to play, I learned a lot. I learned a lot uh, about being a professional. I learned a lot about the NFL, which is also going to help me in the job that I uh, currently serve now. Why did you retire before playing in an NFL game? I wasn't at the level that I wanted to be at. I was pushing through a knee that wasn't made for the game of football anymore. The trauma that my right knee has been through, I didn't want to put it through any more trauma. And, you know, I looked at my life and I said, I'm going to be 30 one day. I'm going to be 35 one day. And I still love to be active. Do I want to risk not having the opportunity to run around with my kids? Or do I want to make a little bit more money and, and play this game that I love? Really came down to that decision. I had to be farsighted and say, look, I want to have kids one day. I want to be able to run with them, play with them. I think that's a little bit more important. It's amazing that you had that foresight because in the moment you get drafted, I mean, it's such an exciting time and you're, you know, you're just itching to get into a game, but to take a step back, in some ways, I look at this as like a huge step in the process of where you are now. And, and this is just from my perspective, where you took a step back, you evaluated yourself, you evaluated you and made that decision. It wasn't somebody else saying something else. And you know what? It was a hard decision. It was not an easy decision. After talking with a few people, it, it became clear decision I needed to make. Walking away from the game I love, uh, hanging those cleats up, was not easy. But, you know, most decisions in life that are that big, you know, whether you're deciding on a job or, you know, what to do next, the uh, transition, what to do, they're never easy decisions. But 
you go with it, you stick with it, and you do the best you can. You try to find that next step, and and and, and that's what I've that's what I've done. I've I've remained steadfast, and I've remained committed uh, to to trying to find that next act in life, and I've I think I found it. To get to that point, because like you said, it's hard to walk away from a game that you love so much. It's 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 a part of your core and always will be. The transition period, what was that like? How did you navigate that? You're in the Bay Area, you walk away, and then it's like this giant, millions of different roads. Like I'm just like curious from your perspective, from a psychological perspective, how do you know which road to pick? Well, at that time, I did what came natural. Uh, what came natural was to go back to school and finish my degree. I knew that would be important in my future. So I went back to the University of South Carolina, enrolled back in school, received my degree in May of 2016 uh, in public health. Again, I still didn't have a clear picture of what I wanted, uh, but I knew what made me happy. Uh, I knew what gave me fulfillment, and that was helping young people. Uh, I didn't know what avenue I wanted to go down to. I wasn't for sure if it was coaching. I tried coaching the first year, and, and it was fun. It was amazing, but I didn't think that was something I wanted to do full time. I started to learn a lot more about myself again, you know, just diving into human nature. And I realized that there's a lot of people walking around who lack that self-awareness. And I realized how important that was in athletics to have. Uh, in athletics, when you have that self-awareness, that transition after your sport ends is not so challenging. If you do, you know, took a stab at director of player development. And Coach Muschamp, I'm so thankful he gave me that opportunity to work with uh, the University of South Carolina. And I learned and I learned and I grew and I helped a lot of kids. Now I'm here at Lewis and Clark working as a life coach, as a mentor. I assist with the running backs, but I'm not the full-time position coach. I realize how important my job is. Being someone who has to find creative ways to motivate, uh, to, to keep the group engaged, uh, but also to provide them with life skills and social skills that are going to help them later on in life that I did not have. Quite frankly, sometimes a counselor, uh, because I am learning those skills and thinking about enrolling into their psychology program to, to receive my master's. My journey revealed to me some things that would help student athletes navigate through the challenges that life presents them. And I try to do that with transparency. I try to do that with the psychology practices that I've learned. I try to do that through humility so they understand that, you know, what I'm saying is, is pertinent to your future. Uh, it, it's important for your future. I'm fulfilled. Uh, I, I enjoy what I do. I want to continue to do this and grow in this role. And I know that you know, eventually I want to end up in a leadership position where I'm moving the chess pieces and, and, and I'm looking at what's best for student athletes. Can I create an environment that is conducive to growth where they are comfortable? When student athletes are comfortable in an environment where they feel they're not being judged, uh, when they're in an environment where they feel that they can come to you, uh, you can pour into them easily and they and they will listen to you. I feel like it all ties back to the mask stuff we were talking about earlier, where when they speak with you, they don't have to they don't have to wear a mask because you're coming at them from that pers with that perspective, I should say, of wearing a mask and and what it does. And you just say, hey, like, let's let's talk about life. And if you want to talk about football, we can talk about football. Um, and I'm sure that's something that they've never seen before, because who does that? Colin, that's, that's the goal of what I'm trying to do. Uh, it's, it's, to, it's to break down those exteriors, take those facades off, take the front off, and speak to them, number one, as human beings. Uh, speak to them with transparency, uh, but also realize that they have somebody that will always listen and not judge them. You know, when that happens, you, you, you come... You don't move away from who you are. You come closer to that core of who you are. 
and, and, and w- which is going to help you find out what you like and what you don't like, what you're interested in. And, you know, that's the goal to try to get them to become the best version of themselves, putting them in a growth mindset, creating an environment where it's comfortable, where they know they're always going to have somebody that listens. I'm going back to what we talked about earlier. I'm thankful for what I went through because now I have real life experience, real tangible experience that they can look at and see, huh, okay, if Coach Lat went through this, I can figure out a way to navigate through this, but we do it together. Student athletes need this more than ever, especially this generation in particular. They're just bombarded and they're saturated by so much information online, especially through social media, kind of change their brain a little bit, trying to be that voice of reason for them. I don't know if you realize this, that you're changing the way that people are approaching sports in life. You're essentially, from my perspective, creating your own niche where you're going in, teaming up with these student athletes and talking about things that parents won't even talk about with their own kids. And Colin, I believe that with this generation, it's a necessity. It's not something that can can be up for negotiation. You, 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 you have to have someone who has social and emotional intelligence within your program if you want to get the best out of this generation. Old school style coaching is not going to work with them anymore. All right. Their attention span has been depleted and it's not their fault. It's just the times that we live in. They live in a different way than, than, than you and I did. You know, to get to them, you must be able to relate to them. If you cannot relate to them, it goes one ear and not the other. It's been fun. It's been a fun challenge to find ways to motivate them because it's not easy. It doesn't matter what your name is. Yes, they knew who I was when I came on campus, but that does not mean anything. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Would you say that you're living your truth now, Marcus? Um... I think that's a great way to put it. I really do. Uh, living, living what I feel convicted in, um, living what I know is vital in growth. Um, being myself, yes, that's absolute. That's the greatest way to put it. I'm living in my truth. When I was doing some research for our conversation, these are the words that I wrote down. Curiosity, faith, spirituality, growth mindset. Those are the words that I I felt seem to describe you in in ways that many people I feel like will, will never have any of that, Marcus. I don't think you could have described it any better. My love for learning, my walk, my faith in believing that if you do good, and you remain committed to it, and you remain consistent, things just tend to work out. It's believing that virtue is enough. I don't strive for things in my life anymore. I don't strive for success. I don't strive for fame or celebrity. I don't strive to be this person. I just try to be the best version of myself that I can be every day. And the only way I feel like you can do that is if you continue to learn, stay curious, uh, continue to find new ways to grow. If you put your faith in something bigger than yourself, if you serve in other people, money comes. Things just work out. Uh, life works out for you. Uh, but you but you can't fool yourself. You know, you have to you have to self-analyze and self-check every day. Because if you don't, you might miss something. Uh, Look in the mirror every day and say, what can I do? And also be compassionate with yourself. Uh, Don't don't beat yourself up when you make a mistake. Uh, Be human and and just continue to go. Just continue to wake up with the right right attitude. It's so hard because for me, when I look at myself in the mirror, when people have asked me, have you ever been beaten up before? I said, yeah, I've beaten myself up thousands of times over the course of my life. And like you said, not only do you have to be compassionate with other people, but yourself. If you're not compassionate with yourself, I mean, it's almost like, how could you be compassionate with other people? How can you do all these other great things that you want to do if you can't even just look at yourself 
and love yourself to a degree. And I don't mean that in a, I mean that in, in, in the best way possible, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And, and I completely agree with you. You know, there's, there's a big difference between self-criticism and self-compassion. Only one of those leads to you developing confidence. If you want to be a confident person, every time you drop a ball or you fumble the ball, you cuss yourself out or you, uh, you throw an interception and you're just cussing yourself out, well, now you're going to ruminate on that thought. You're going to ruminate on that thought over and over and over again. You're going to replay how terrible of a person you are. Just because you made a mistake or you failed, that doesn't define who you are. But if you talk to yourself with more gentle words or, or, or you look at yourself as a human, you'll realize that you, you'll laugh those things off. Not necessarily laughing at when you make a mistake or, or you fail, but you'll laugh at the fact that, man, I can't believe I used to talk to myself like that. You're beating yourself up. Now you got your coach beating yourself, beating you up. I mean, that's you, you're not going to win that fight. But, but you, you develop confidence when you talk to yourself in a way that is soothing. Talk to yourself in a way that is uh, more productive. It's a big difference in those two. And, and the, the first initial reaction for us as humans is to beat ourselves up because we put a lot of expectations on ourselves. I still do it to this day, but I'm learning that that doesn't develop confidence. You have to talk to yourself in a way as if you like yourself. And that's something I struggle with all the, all the time. It, and it's so weird how you could help other people, but then when it comes to yourself, you know, if a friend asks me for help with something, I'll help them, I'll do what I can. But then when it comes to something internal with myself, all of a sudden it's become this trying to climb Mount Everest ordeal. And you think about it, you're, you're like, what's the difference? It's take those same pra take the same practices of kindness and gentleness and just bestow that upon yourself. You bring up a beautiful point. It, it's looking at yourself objectively, looking at yourself for what you are, not looking at yourself through the lens, through a subjective lens. And when I say objectively, like this is, you are not that interception. You are not that fumble. You are not that mistake. You're a human that made a mistake. You're a human that is having an issue. You're a human that's having a challenge. That's you, you're not defined by that challenge. When you look at yourself for what it like, just straight objectively, you realize that exactly what you just said, you give yourself the advice you would give your best friend. <laughs> That's all you have to do. I mean, this, the stuff we've talked about it, it's, it's simple when we verbalize it to one another, right? We say it and we're like, yes. And then you get put in that you get put in that trying moment and then all of a sudden it's like, wait a second. I, it's like you totally lose yourself and you forget what to do. And that's why I love what you're doing so much, Marcus. Why like you're impacting these kids. These kids will never forget it. And you want to know what? Then they're going to pass that on. The impact you're going to have is going to last generations. And I think that's something you should feel great about, dude. I mean, I don't know what else you could ask for. Thank you, Carla. I, I I appreciate you saying that. I saw a quote that applies to what you just said. It's about a coach and the impact that he will have in 10 years versus somebody that goes through their whole life. And, and you know what? That, that's that's the beautiful thing about coaching, teaching, uh, any, any profession where you're allowed to be in front of young people. You have a lot of power in that situation. How you choose to use that power is is up to you. I've just chose to use it in a way. I mean, it's just like Lauren Hill or J. Cole or, you know, just like through their music, how they teach people. I mean, it's just, it's inspiring to think about. You know, I, I look at people who do it and I'm like, man, I want to be that. I want to do what they do, but they just do it through music or whatever avenue that you're doing it through. You're doing it the same thing with your podcast. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the mainstream media. It's not what people would would expect, but it's what people need. It's what people need to hear, not what they want to hear. And that's exactly it. I want people to know that 
yes, like you're you are a fantastic football player. I mean that, but I but there's so much more, and that's what I want people to know, and that's what people are going to understand from this is the depth of of who you are, Marcus. Like I I, I got chills midway through this conversation because you're diving into you know when you brought up the mask and people wearing masks. We we've all done it, whether we're an athlete. Or, or not. We've all done it. And, and some of us never take that mask off. And that's the scary part because imagine if you do take it off and yeah, like it may feel uncomfortable and, but to, to feel comfortable and, for, and fulfilled, you have to feel discomfort. You, 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 you're so right. You're so right. And you know, one of my favorite writers of all time, this quote is ingrained in my head and I'll never forget it. And it always reminds me that what I'm doing is is necessary and it's important. It's by James Baldwin. He says, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I, too, know that self-delusion. Because when you don't examine your life, you don't live in reality. You, li- you, 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 you live in what you want the world to be. You know, we're only confined by the walls we build ourselves. And, and those walls are just mental walls. They're they're it's a mental prison. It's a school for the world. It, it's not a school for living. Uh, if we continue to examine our lives, and we, we we come closer to everything. And I'm not there yet. It's a it's a continuous. You 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 examine your life until death. It's it's not something that just oh I've arrived. No, it's it's. I mean it, you, you know unless you're a monk. You know, enlightened souls and liberated souls, they've examined their selves to a T. I feel like it's fear based because if you do examine yourself, then it's 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 scary. I mean, you're doing it, I'm I'm doing it myself, and it, it, it is daunting. You know, the moment that I knew that I needed to start examining myself from an outsider's perspective was probably the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. And and and, and that fear that fear is what you're exactly right. It's what it, what stops us. And, th- and that's why, man, you know, Brene Brown, uh, she, she writes about, she's an expert on shame. Uh, she's studied emotions. She's an expert on uh, guilt. Uh, that's what she talks about. Uh, she says, having the courage to be imperfect is the first step in finding yourself. Courage is knowing that fear is right there, but still doing it anyway. And that, and that courage to be an imperfect creature is what sets you out on that quest. It's just realizing that, yeah, you know, these people who may portray a certain image, but nobody ex- is exempt from human nature. Everybody feels suffering. Everybody feels joy. Everybody feels pain. Every everybody's been angry, mad, upset. We just cover it up a little bit differently. You hit so many fantastic points throughout this entire podcast, but it, it, especially right now, I want to. I want people to know about your writing, Marcus, and I, I hope you don't mind. I want to read this. It's titled ABC. There is no end point or enchanted destination. There is no finish line where you run through in celebration. Just a lot of roadblocks and a lot of detours. And when you get through those, you won't receive a reward because it'll just be more and some more after that. The best thing to do, surrender to this fact. We're not in control and never will be because nothing in life is ABC. But who would want it to be? Have it come easy? To have everything perfect? Simply as one, two, three? Life without a rebuttal? Yeah, you can keep that. Fall in love with the struggle, and the struggle will love you back. Yeah, thank you. Um, sometimes in life we expect um, we expect things to go ideally. We want life to end up a certain way. If I work hard and I do what I'm supposed to, I'm going to have a career in the NFL. You know, I, there were so many things I wanted. You know, out of that experience, I want to, you know, rush for 10,000 yards. That was a goal of mine. I want to be in the Hall of Fame. I wanted, you know, six touchdowns my first year. None of that happened. Life goes on. Life goes on regardless. 
whether you like your situation or not, you can't control it, number one. And number two, nothing in life is ideal. If you're waiting on ideal conditions, you'll be waiting forever. Humans, for millions of years, have had the capability to adapt. We've had the capability to respond when things don't go our way. But we conveniently forget that. We're creatures that can adapt to anything. We're creatures that can respond to anything. And, and we can make the most out of our situation. I always think about uh, Viktor Frankl, who wrote a book called A Man's Search for Meaning. He talks about being in concentration camps in Auschwitz, in Poland, and, and what it was like. And he describes this man who, you know, walked into the gas chamber and prayed and said, you will not take my dignity. Uh, in a situation like that, he didn't have an excuse. He couldn't control his situation. Even a man who knows he's about to die can die with dignity. That just, pr that, that just proves to me that anybody can do it. He knows he's about to walk into a gas chamber. He knows his life's about to end. But he sends a prayer up to the Lord and says, no, they will not take my dignity. That seals the deal for me. You know, you look at Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide. People knew, you know, that they were about to be cut or butchered or macheted, you know, by the other tribe, you know, and, and, they're, and they're calling out, you know, oh, Lord, I, I mean, it's just if they can adapt and they can respond, we all have the capability to do it. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for reading that. I mean, it's, it's amazing because as I'm reading that, and obviously from our conversation now and from what we chatted about in the pre-call and, and everything, it's like I, you can kind of feel the certain points of your life you know, with what you're writing, uh, but you do it in, in such a, a poetic way that it, ju it, just it just makes sense. There are so many different things that you've written on, on that page, and, and I think those are things that really resonate, especially with the kids that you help now. The last thing I want to ask you, if you could go back in time and chat with 19-year-old Marcus Lattimore, what would you tell him? Uh, How good the food is in Portland, right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I would tell him, seriously? Uh, I wouldn't tell him anything. I just, I put on a song for him. Uh, Bob Marley, Don't Worry About a Thing. Great song. I just, I, I just put that on. I put that song on and, and have it on repeat. It's like just thinking about the song. Once you said once you said it, I started playing it in my head and it just instantaneously brings a smile. Yeah. And, and, and because, you know, at that time, so many things are going on. So many things were going on in my life. So many unknowns, so much pressure. Life was just moving so fast. Uh, but if you could just don't worry. Stop worrying because you're not in control anyway. You're not in control of what anything happened. You just have to do your best every day. It was so much external pressure that dominated my thoughts and dominated my mind that if I would have heard that song, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it might have been different. I call you a student of the world. And to be a student of the world, it means doing what you're doing right now. You and the wife and the poodle leaving the comforts of South Carolina, moving to the Pacific Northwest, Portland, which, by the way, I'm stoked to have the three of you on the West Coast as a West Coast guy. Welcome. Yes, um, it's, just, it's been amazing to speak with you, and I'm really excited for people to, to listen to your messages because I don't care if you're an athlete, uh, a business, a businessman, businesswoman, whatever you do, all this is applicable in so many different ways. So thank you uh, for taking the time to, to speak with me and, and enlighten me and to open up my mind 